Hello, I'm Dr. Cecile Cospuluela. Welcome to this ESL video on English grammar, and more precisely on the translation of the French pronoun on, um, which maybe is not as easy as it might seem. So, uh, in order to deal with that question, let's use the <clears throat> let's use the diagram for the translation process and the formula R one O two I three. So, a simple formula based on Peirce's semiotic definition of the sign, but I will not go. Uh, give any more details about that question here. Basically, what you need to understand and remember is very simple. We have a tendency to, um, to uh, whenever we have something to translate, we tend to translate it right away and go too fast. So, very simply, the main thing in order to translate successfully consists in making sure you read the source text well enough so that you can actually understand its meaning. And once you get it, then you can express it with the means of the target language. And that's exactly what we're going to do here with on. We're going to um, consider that on is R1, and we're going to look for O2. What does on refer to? And once we have uh, analyzed that question, then analyzed the meaning of on, then we're able to uh, translate it into English. So let's look at examples. On dit que cet hôtel est très bien. So, as usual, make sure you pause the video to take the time to translate the sentences before uh, I do. So, in this case, what does on refer to? Well, we do not really know. There's not enough context for us to know. So, all we can see is that on refers to something that is not definite, it is vague, it's not specified or even unknown. And in that case, on is translated most of the times by the passive voice and the formula for the passive voice is V plus V-E-N. Therefore, the translation here is going to be this hotel is said to be very good. So the subject of the passive voice sentence, as you remember, is the object of the active voice sentence here in French. And then we can see we have B plus V and so B in the present tense and the past participle of the verb said. Uh, next sentence, on pense que le raid aérien effectué par l'Afrique du Sud sur la capitale du Mozambique est une mesure de représailles. So obviously, this sentence is very long and you might be impressed by the number of details that you have to deal with. But uh, the main thing is to remain calm and look at what needs to be translated. So the first difficult point here is on. So again, we analyze it and what does it refer to? Well, it has the same vague meaning as in the previous sentence. So again, we're going to use the passive voice to translate it. And the subject of the passive voice is going to be, as always, the object of the active voice sentence. So here, the object is really, really long, but it doesn't really matter. And it's not that hard to translate. It's almost word for word translation. So, uh, the air raid carried out on the capital of Mozambique by South Africa. Um, and then we need to add the verb, and we know we're going to add the verb with the passive voice. So, it's not just that the air raid, blah, blah, blah. So, all of that I could replace by it. It's not just that it is a retaliation measure. It is that is it, sorry, it is thought to be 
a retaliation measure. Okay, so that's where we're going to use the passive voice here, B plus D-E-N. A-t-on appelé le médecin? So again, on in this sentence doesn't refer to anything that's clearly defined. On the contrary, therefore, it is again going to be translated by the passive voice. And, um, and clearly, what we focus on is the doctor, which is going to become the subject of the active voice sentence. Therefore, the translation will be, has the doctor been called for? Um, and if we just call him or her on the phone, we do not need the preposition here. But then if we await them any minute, uh, they should be arriving any minute, then in that case, the preposition is required. So in these three sentences, what we can see is that on has a very vague meaning. So it is translated by B plus V N, the passive voice, which is very logical because actually if we focus on the meaning of those sentences, what we're actually interested in is the hotel, the raid, the doctor. And so it's very much like in sentence number four, in which we're interested in the Chinese students and therefore once we have chosen this subject, then the rest of the sentence can only be expressed with the passive voice. Uh, so it's really very much the same kind of logic that is at stake, the logic that we have mentioned in the video on the passive voice, in which we have uh, shown that we don't really choose the voice. What we choose is the subject that we're interested in the topic, the theme that we want to talk about. And once we have chosen the subject, then the voice is um, necessarily chosen by the subject itself. So in sentence number four, the translation is going to be the Chinese students have not been listened to by the hardliners of the party. And in this case, again, you listen to somebody. To is a preposition. Listen to is a prepositional verb. Uh, in other words, it is um, um, an indirect transitive verb. And therefore, the preposition is absolutely uh, necessary in the passive voice sentence. So that's one of the difficult points that we have highlighted in the video on the passive voice. On l'a mis à la porte à la fin du mois. Again, who uh, l'a mis à la porte? Who, who uh, fired him? Well, we do not know. So the same vague meaning here as in the previous sentences. And the um, difficulty here is maybe to choose between uh, constructing the passive voice with B plus V N or with get plus B N. So uh, both are possible. What's the difference? When whenever you use B plus V N, it may express either an action or the result of that action. Whereas when you use get plus V E N you necessarily refer to the action itself and there is no ambiguity so that get plus b get plus v e n is a way to um, underline the the action and the change in the state of the subject so he was fired at the end of the month is less dynamic then he got fired at the end of the month. And that is one of the points that we mentioned again in the video on the passive voice. Two ways to build the passive voice, the most common one, B plus V N, and use get instead of B anytime you want to uh, highlight the fact that there is an action and a state.
state, the state of the subject changes. On a offert une belle cravate à mon père pour son anniversaire. So in this case, the verb has two objects. Une belle cravate et à mon père. Which means that um, it is actually possible to use either one of these objects to, as a subject in the passive voice sentence that will be required here to translate the idea the, that we have in on. Therefore, uh, a beautiful tie was given to my father for his birthday is the first option here. And, uh, and then if we had on a offert à mon père une belle cravate pour son anniversaire, then the order of the objects would require us to focus more on the fact that it's been given to my father and therefore the translation would rather be my father was given a beautiful tie for his birthday and the theme, the topic of the sentence would be the father in that case. There is um, a spe special syntactic um, structure in French that we can use to translate this kind of sentences, and it is written here, mon père s'est vu offrir une belle cravate. So it's a special phrasing to actually highlight the subject that we're focusing on, much as um, what happens in the passive voice sentence. So uh, remember that this translation can be very useful to translate some passive voice sentences as soon as we want to focus on a specific subject. And in this uh, last sentence, number six, the verb had two objects. So it was a ditransitive verb, and we deal with the questions of ditransitive verbs or verbs that have two objects, like here a tie and the new boy, in the video on the passive voice. Let's have a look at the next example. On a promis au grévistes. Une augmentation de 10%. So again, who does on refer to? We do not know. We're going to use the passive voice to express the vagueness of uh, the reference here. And then what do we focus on then? If it's not the subject, which is too vague, then it is the object. And the object, the strikers, is then going to be the subject of the translation. And once we have chosen that subject, then we have no other option than to use the passive voice. Therefore, the translation will be, the strikers were promised a 10% rise. And obviously, on a promis une augmentation de 10% au grévis. If you mention this object first, it means logically, that you're more interested in this object and therefore that it's logical for you to use it at the, as the subject of the passive voice sentence in English. A 10% rise was promised to the strikers. And again, we could use the same syntactic structure as in the previous sentence, as in both sentences we have um, ditransitive verbs, verbs with two objects, and it is possible to say here in French, les grévistes se sont vus promettre une augmentation de 10%. Uh, as you remember from working on that video on verbs with two objects or ditransitive verbs, it is not possible for any ditransitive verb to uh, be constructed with the two active voice structures and the two passive voice structures. It's only possible for some of them and others. Uh, for others, you need to make sure you use the constructions that are possible. 
la meilleure instruction que l'on puisse recevoir en Grande-Bretagne. So again, on here refers to something that is really vague. Therefore, the passive voice will be appropriate. The best education to be received in Great Britain or to be had, because in this case, have is possible, even though it is uh, seldom used. But when it's a synonym for receive or get, then it works and it can be used in the passive voice sentences. Uh, and also in other limited cases, like here, il a eu une contravention pour excès de vitesse, which could be translated by he was had up for exceeding the speed limit. Obviously, we're just presenting the various possibilities that are available to translate the pronoun on into English. But each of these sentences could maybe be translated differently. Like here, for instance, we could say uh, he got fined or he had a ticket for exceeding the speed limit. So the point is not to present the different uh, possibilities for each sentence, but to present the different ways that on can be translated into English. So, so far we've been, we have seen that on, when it has a really vague meaning, is generally translated with the passive voice. Let's go on to example number 10. On frappa à la porte, or on sonna à la porte. Are we going to use the passive voice here? It would sound awkward. Therefore, let's choose another option. There was a knock at the door or a ring at the door. Obviously, it would also be possible to say somebody knocked at the door, uh, which would be a really good translation, but we're presenting a, a general overview of the different ways to translate on, and we will deal with um, those pronouns later on. So right now, let us add to our little summary here that on can be translated with the passive voice and with impersonal forms like there, uh, generally followed by be, which obviously needs to be conjugated. So on tira un coup de feu près de nous could be translated differently And there is a perfectly acceptable option. There was a shot near us. And on applaudit à tout rompre. In that case as well, different options could be possible. Um, so, um, yeah, the audience burst into applause would be a possibility. Uh, but there's also the possibility to use there. There was a burst of applause. So different examples for you to remember that this impersonal form here is often used to translate on when it has a really vague meaning. On dit dans les journaux que les prix baissent. So in this case, We're going to use the passive form with another impersonal pronoun. Not there, this time it wouldn't work, but it is uh, the right one. It is said in the papers that prices are falling. On dirait qu'il va pleuvoir can be translated again with the same pronoun. It looks like rain. On pourrait croire qu'il a raison, mais... And uh, in that case, we could again use the pronoun it. It might look as if he were right, but... And so let us add the impersonal form it in, on our list of... Um, of um, our list of the different ways to translate the pronoun on into English. Next example. Uh, on ne peut s'empêcher de penser que le nouvel impôt est injuste. So again, there might be different options here. And let's use this sentence to show that on, 
when it has, it still has a really vague meaning, can be translated by uh, personal pronouns like one here, which belongs to a formal way of expressing oneself. And so one can't help thinking that the new tax is unfair or iniquitous is a formal way of expressing oneself. This sentence could obviously uh, translate it also by um, other pronouns, like you could say, you can't help thinking that the new tax is iniquitous. So one is formal and you is informal. On n'est jamais maître chez soi, another example in which on can be translated by one. If you want to sound formal, one is never the master in one's own home. And it's interesting to notice that one can be used with the genitive. Uh, and obviously, again, you would sound less formal. On devrait toujours essayer de se discipliner dans les limites du raisonnable. Same remark here. One is very formal. You would not be formal at all. Il fallait être aveugle pour ne pas voir qu'ils étaient amoureux. Maybe the context here um, seems more appropriate for a less formal translation. So maybe you would be better than one, but it's always a question of what you really mean and what context that sentence appears in. So you had to be blind not to see that they were in love. Could be a, a more appropriate translation maybe than the indefinite pronoun one because one is very formal. Um, so at any rate, when translating on, when, if on has an indefinite meaning, we use either the passive voice or impersonal forms or pronouns. So one is really vague. And I think that we switch to a um, second category of ways to translate on in which on is not as vague or indefinite as in the first category, even though it still is obviously not very precise. And in this category, we'll find the pronoun you that, um, yes, yeah, seems to be less general, less vague than one. On a encore oublié d'éteindre la lumière. Who's on in that case? Well, uh, it doesn't seem possible to use, to use one or you. And actually, the best option here would be to use a different pronoun like someone. Someone has forgotten to turn off the light again. Le train s'arrêta et on descendit. Who's on? in this case. Um, so is it me and my sister? I don't have uh, any proof of that. And I really need to be sure that that on means new in order to translate on by we. Otherwise, I just avoid it and remain more general. So in this case, the pronoun everyone seems appropriate. The train stopped and everyone got off. So um, the third possibility to translate on uh, is a series of pronouns with one that's very formal, you that's informal, and then someone, everyone, everybody, nobody, anybody, and all those pronouns here that can be used to refer to on when its meaning is vague, but not as vague as in the first category. Il paraît qu'on va encore augmenter le prix de l'essence. It is really tempting to reformulate that sentence in French, 
Uh, using a different pronoun. Il paraît qu'ils vont encore augmenter le prix de l'essence. And that's enough to um, see that it is very logical to use the pronoun they in English to translate on in this case. Apparently, they're going to raise the price of petrol in the United Kingdom, gas, which is the short for gasoline in the United States again. Uh, therefore, in the series of pronouns that can be used to translate on, they will be used, obviously, when the speaker, uh, the speaker is excluded. Okay, the speaker, l'énonciateur. On a de plus en plus de mal à boucler les fins de mois. If it is clear from the context that on is me and my husband, then in that case, and in that case only, um, I am going to translate on by we. But you really need to make sure that on corresponds to the meaning of nous before you can translate it by we. And that's the only case in which it is appropriate. So we're having more and more trouble making ends meet. And um, with that translation, we actually reach the third category of um, the different ways to translate on, because this time on seems to be a little bit less vague or more precise. And indeed, when you translate on by nous and in English by we, in which the speaker, l'énonciateur, is included, then the object is rather precise and much less vague than in the previous two categories. On le respectait dans la ville, mais on ne se liait pas d'amitié avec lui. So again, in the formula R1, O2, I3, the first step in translating is intralingual translation. That is to say, translating from the source language into the source language. So reformulating the meaning of the sentence using different words in the same language. So here, on le respectait dans la ville, It is very possible to translate on by les gens and therefore switch to the English people respected him in the town and the pronoun to refer to people is they but they did not make friends with him. And with that example, we reach the fourth category of um, words that we can use to translate the pronoun on. So we have seen the passive voice in personal forms. Number three is a series of pronouns. And number four is going to be a series of nouns, the first of which is people, from which the speaker, l'énonciateur, is excluded. It is also possible to use the noun a man, even though it sounds a bit um, odd or old today. That's my comfort. A man can die but once. That is really a literary sentence. And a man in that case may be translated by on, but that's not very much used today. So... Uh, we're just pointing it out for you to know that it is used in literature. The noun phrase, a man, uh, may be used uh, with the same kind of meaning as on. On peut demander à ce qu'un poste de télévision soit installé dans la chambre. Who's on in that case? Since we are in a hospital, then on is clearly the patients. Therefore, it is possible to translate the pronoun on by the noun patients because the analysis clearly shows that they refer to the same reality. So patients can ask for a TV set to be installed in their rooms. 
How about the next one? On ne peut sortir pendant l'épreuve. Who's that on at university? Well, obviously, it refers to the students. Therefore, students are not allowed to go out during the exam. So, as you can see, um, the analysis of the context can lead us to use a number of different nouns because they correspond, they refer to the same reality as on in the source text. Let's take a last example. On avance ainsi dans son entourage perestroïkiste que M. Chevarnadze avait donné au conservateur de trop beaux prétextes. So, who's on? Obviously, on is the perestroika people around Mr. Chevarnadze. Therefore, we can use that noun to refer to translate on by his pro perestroika aides are suggesting that Chevernadze gave the conservatives far too good excuses. Okay, so this last example, which was published in the Guardian Weekly, um, shows us that the list of nouns that can be used to translate on cannot be exhaustive. You just analyze the context and you see if you can deduce from the context what on refers to, in which case it is quite appropriate to translate it with a noun. Uh, okay, so I guess that's it. This is um, a summary of the different possibilities to translate the pronoun on and at the bottom are the ones with the lesser degree of vagueness, indefiniteness and at the top here are the, the cases in which on has a really important degree of vagueness it refers to an object that is really very vague, very indefinite. So to conclude, four main, main ways to translate the pronoun on, the passive voice, impersonal forms, and pronouns is number three. So one which is very formal, you which is informal and less indefinite. And then a series of pronouns, someone, no one, anyone, and so on. Um, and the pronoun they, which is very similar to the French, and from which the speaker is excluded. And the third category, in which the, um, the object to which on refers is more precise with we, that corresponds to nous in French. And then the fourth category, nouns, which cannot be exhaustive. And you can choose the appropriate noun depending on the context. Okay, so uh, that's it for this video. I hope it's been useful. And, um, well, I'll see you in the next video. And in the meantime... I want to thank you for your attention, encourage you to keep up the good work, and wish you all the best.